is this amazingly busy and active guy fighting the good fight across the entire state. But the reason he's here, and rather than go into this incredibly lengthy bio of this guy, Jonathan is the, is the Director of Programs and Communications for Connecticut Against Gun Violence. And he's also one of the leaders in the grass movement, grassroots movement for the national popular vote. So he will explain both of those, but certainly our focus today um, is, and is on gun violence. Since the tragic, and I'll just read part of his bio, since the tragic Sandy Hook shooting, school shooting, Jonathan has committed his time and energy to support and lead a wide range of gun violence prevention activities. Um, in addition to his work with CAGV, he led the Greenwich Council Against Gun Violence, which is a local grassroots advocacy organization based in Greenwich. He's one of the founding members of the Southwestern Connecticut chapter of the Brady Campaign to prevent gun violence. Um, and his opinion pieces on gun violence prevention appear regularly in Connecticut-based news media. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand this off to you. So thank you. Thanks so much, Carol. Um, so the one I'm going, if I could get people to sign in, that would be great. And I am testing something today, which is electronic sign-in, so that I don't have to like transcribe all the emails and stuff. That said, if you would rather do paper, I will send that around too. Um, and we, we ask for your address so that we can target, like particularly when we're doing state things, we can target you um, based on who your legislator is. That's why we're asking for your address. Oh, and, and just to say, Jonathan is going to meet with us in a small group up in the chapel. So as far as these sign-ins, I think what we'll probably do is we'll have it over on the table. But then please come by the chapel on your way to the small group. And that way we can help you with the sign in electronically and it, we can just move the process along. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, so. Um, so there's a lot to talk about and so I'm going to try to go through quickly and then afterwards I'm definitely happy to answer any questions. Um, there's a whole lot of things that we could talk about. We're not going to talk about all of them just in the interest of time. Um, but. The first thing to recognize is this is a huge, huge problem. It really is a public health crisis with 33,000 Americans dying every year from gun violence. Um, and just some kind of statistics to put that into um, perspective. More Americans have died. Um, sorry, it should be the other way around. The other way around. Yeah. Uh, Writing late at night, um, more Americans have died by gun violence since 1968, one and a half million than have died in all the wars in our history, which is about 1.2 million. And if you think about um, people who have been, and this includes you know, combat people who have died in the global war on terror since 2001, the number who have been killed by gun violence since 68 is 215 times more. So it's a huge problem. Um, I have this video, which I'm not going to show now, as so it takes about 10 minutes. Um, you don't really appreciate the full depth of what this problem is by just looking at a lot of statistics, so we tried to kind of tell some of the stories behind it, but in the interest of time, um, I'm going to skip over that, and we can always um, look at that later. So the first question is, how do guns actually get into the wrong hands? Because all guns actually start as legal guns. We do actually have you know, confidence that gun manufacturers despicable as they are in some ways, actually do send their guns into legal channels, which are federally licensed gun dealers. And there's basically two ways um, that ultimately what should have been a legal gun can become an illegal gun. Either a straw purchase, so somebody goes in and buys it on behalf of somebody else, who the reason is that they can't pass the background check, um, or it could be trafficking, so they buy a bunch of guns knowing that they're going to sell it illegally. And then through some kind of private sale, um, either illegally because they're evading, let's say a state like Connecticut, um, they know they're supposed to do a background check, but they don't do it, so it's on the black market. And legally in many states where um, at private you know, gun shows over the internet, um, you can actually legally sell a gun to someone without a background check. And that's how one way they get into the hands of criminals. Um, the other way is lost and stolen guns. Um, and this is actually a problem that could be solvable, but again, we have you know, these, these sort of institutional barriers to getting things done. 
because it was actually like 1% of dealers are responsible for 60% of the crime guns. So when they trace guns back, they, it takes a bit, a bit of time, but they can figure out who actually sold it originally. And so 1% represents 60%, 5% of dealers represent 95% of all crime guns. And the problem there really is the ATF. They don't have the resources to do the monitoring that they're supposed to. Um, and then this, this stolen guns, lost and stolen guns is a huge issue. And so 400,000 every year, a lot of them are stolen out of cars. They're actually stolen from gun dealers. Um, in Connecticut a while ago, we created a lost and stolen reporting requirement. Because what would happen is, you know, somebody would illegally sell a gun, and then it would be found and traced back from a crime, and they say, oh, you know, I lost it, or somebody stole that, and now at least you're accountable. Um, we have very strong gun laws here in Connecticut, but this is one area where we cannot just depend on the strength of our own laws. We are kind of dependent on the weakness of other states' laws and the weakness of laws at the federal level. And so, um, of the guns that have been traced back to their origin, almost half of them are coming from out of state. And the top five states are Florida, Georgia, and Maine. Um, there's this law center to prevent gun violence. They grade states each year. Those three states have failing grades in terms of the strength of their gun laws. And uh, number four and five, in terms of their, their exporting crime guns, have Ds. So it says states with weak gun laws have a lot of crime guns and they make their way across state borders. I um, want to just talk quickly about, so what, what are federal gun laws at this point? Um, so to the extent that you follow the, this, this issue at all, you've probably heard of Heller, the Heller decision in 2008, and that is when the Supreme Court found an individual right to gun ownership and based on the Second Amendment. Um, and that actually overturned 70 years of precedent from a case decided in, I think it was in 1939, Miller versus the U.S., which stated very clearly that the obvious intent of the Second Amendment was about militia, you know, real militias. Um, and so courts for 70 years had relied on that to, to um, either support or turn down a lot of gun laws. Um, and then following Heller, there was the, the court decision McDonald, which found that this, um, this individual right, constitutional right, actually extended to states as well. Um, and there have been tons of challenges to various gun laws on the basis of you know, constitutional challenges. The good news is, um, and for this reason only, um, most of those challenges are, are being turned back because um, even Antonin Scalia in his um, uh, whatever, um, <laughs> recognized that there were limits to this right. Um, and it was very clear, and it was actually his words. Um, it is kind of interesting how the, the gun rights advocates, they always talk about the Constitution, but they seem to dismiss the Supreme Court, which is the interpreter of the Constitution. Um, I, I was doing some research a while back on the history of gun laws in, in the United States, and you know, we talk about the gun lobby and the NRA. They existed all the way back you know, 50 years ago, so when the Gun Control Act of 1968 was being passed by um, Johnson, as he was signing it, he lamented the fact that he could not get national registration and licensing because the voices of a powerful lobby, a gun lobby that has prevailed for the moment. So this is actually, this problem of this powerful gun lobby is not new. Um, so I, I won't go through this too much. The, um, the kind of most important one of the very important laws was the National Firearms Act of 1934, um, which regulated the manufacture and sale of machine guns and silencers, and those are, the, particularly the silencers, is being um, attacked right now in terms of trying to roll that back. Um, and um, in 1938, there's the Federal Firearms Act, which started to create um, licensed dealers. Um, 1994 was kind of the high point of um, Gun, gun safety laws, which that created the background check, the Brady background check that was after came after the, the Reagan assassination attempt, um, and it took seven years for them to pass that. So as we think of 
the challenge of passing gun laws today, we kind of have to keep in perspective that this is something that takes um, a long time. Um, and then um, that was also when um, the, the assault weapons ban went into place in 94, um, and also starting to confront the issue of domestic violence and firearms, which is a huge problem. Um, mm. and, then, and then bad things started happening. Uh, the Dickey Amendment, that's the, the amendment, it's a rider to appropriations bill that prohibits the CDC from doing any research that could promote gun control. And that's been interpreted fairly conservatively as to say we can't do any research at all. Um, there's, a, there's an amazing statistic, which I don't have the exact numbers of, if you compare the number of gun deaths to the amount, the dollars spent on research for gun violence, it's like a teeny little fraction compared to, let's say, the amount of research done into you know, other, the, the flu or other things that actually kill far, far fewer people. And so it's, it, that has had a huge impact. And then the T. Hart amendments um, in 2003 put a lot of constraints on the ATF and the FBI in terms of how they could trace guns. And so it actually makes it very difficult to come up with those statistics, or not the statistics, but the, um, the information of where are crime guns coming from. There's a lot of stuff. The, the ATF is not allowed to keep computerized records of gun sales. I mean, it's just, it's atrocious. Uh, so, um, and it was interesting, Connecticut actually has had a big role in um, gun laws um, going back to 68 and actually even before that. So it was the senior Thomas Dodd, our senator, who was sort of the prime mover behind the Gun Control Act of um, 1968. And I was doing, I actually had presented this um, down in Stanford, and um, a person said, well, it, the, the mayor of Stanford in, uh, it was like in the 1930s, became the attorney general, and he was the one who was behind the Gun Control Act of, uh, or the, the Firearms Act of 1934. That has a long, proud history of doing the right thing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about kind of what the public thinks about gun laws, because there's, there's some good stuff, and then there's some also awesome things that we have to work on. The fact is the majority of the public supports most gun laws. Um, and so going all the way down to, you know, banning assault weapons and large capacity magazines. Um, there's really, there's a, a high level of support. In fact, the Quinnipiac just came out with um, a poll last week um, about universal background check and stuff to like 95, 96%, which is the, the highest level ever. Um, and that a lot of these things, they, they clearly do vary by Democrats versus Republicans, but the one that has sort of universal appeal is background checks, you know, e even including gun owning households. Um, but there is this kind of disconnect, and um, there's a couple of reasons. One, um, and, and so the, the disconnect is what's more important, controlling gun ownership or protecting the right of Americans to own guns. And it was in um, December of 2015 that for the first time, um, more people felt that it was important to protect the right of Americans to own guns than to control gun ownership. Now, part of it is because people don't actually recognize what laws we have, and they actually think we have much stronger laws than we do. And so among the people who um, uh, favor stronger enforcement as opposed to new laws, half of them think we have universal background checks and assault weapons bans. So if you think we have lots of good laws, let's just enforce them, but we don't. Um, and the other thing, and this gets into the wording of this question um, by Pew and, and some others, is when you talk about sort of rights and government control, it doesn't matter what the topic is, People, you know, a lot of Americans sort of recoil at, you know, government control. And so the, the wording really does matter in terms of how you ask these questions. And every town had done some polling and positioned it somewhat differently. What's, you know, is it more important to keep uh, guns out of the hands of dangerous people um, versus protecting the right to own guns? And they, they found a quite different outcome. Um, but, and, and it's actually a function of all the horrible things that are happening. The overall level of support for stricter gun laws is really at its lowest level since, since 1990. You know, back in 1998 out of 10 thought we um, needed stricter laws versus looser laws. Um, and it has been climbing over the past, you know, five years basically since Newtown, but now it's at 60%. 
Um, and you can see the, the, the partisan divide is just enormous. So 90% of Democrats believe we should have stricter laws and only a third of Republicans do. And so that that's explains some of the problem that we're having getting things done in Congress. Um, the other problem is that sort of what we call the passion gap. And um, the fact is gun rights advocates um, they, that is like the singular thing they care about. And so kind of the way to, to measure this is um, they ask people, you know, would you ever support somebody who didn't agree with your views on gun control? And if you believe gun laws should be less strict, I would never vote for somebody that doesn't believe that, seven out of 10 people. But if I believe gun, sh gun control, gun laws should be more strict, that's kind of a single issue, single issue thing for only a third of voters. Um, so we have to start, you know, sort of increasing um, people's passion and kind of why I do things like this. Um, this was a, a hearing that was um, in Southbury a couple weeks ago, where um, a couple of residents had introduced a, or proposed an ordinance to ban um, guns from um, at public public events on town property as well as in town-owned buildings. And uh, so it was put to the Board of Selectmen. They were supposed to report back about sort of the feasibility of doing this. And so they scheduled the regular Board of Selectmen meeting. And about 125 gun rights guys showed up. And they canceled, fortunately, they canceled the meeting because it exceeded the capacity of the room. So it was rescheduled. They moved it to High School Auditorium where 500 people showed up. And we had a, a really good showing, but there were twice as many gun rights guys as there were mm. gun violence prevention people. Mm. Um, so, and that it's stuff unfortunately doesn't matter. Um, so where are things in Connecticut? Um, we do have the second strongest laws in the nation. That's been the case for the last three, four years, basically <coughs> since the, the laws that were passed after the Sandy Hook school shooting. Um, and we have the fifth lowest uh, gun death rate. And as I'll show you later, those things are, the, the, the connection is not an accident. Um, our gun deaths in 2016 were the lowest since we've been tracking them since 2002. Um, you can kind of see the, the, and I'll talk about suicides, which account for about two-thirds of the gun deaths in Connecticut, as they do nationwide. Um, this year is probably, it's probably going to be higher. It's not been a good year, particularly in Bridgeport. Um, and someone in Hartford, New Haven, has, has been very effective. Um, uh, here's a lot of all laws. I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, but suffice it to say we have background checks on all purchases. Um, assault weapons are banned. Um, if, you had some, if you had assault weapons, you could keep them if you registered them um, after the Sandy Hook, the, the 2013 bill. Um, prohibit large capacity magazines. Um, you have to get a permit to buy a gun. So we do know who has been allowed to buy guns. And that permit has to, and the, the requirements to get the permit include a background check, um, also um, some basic training. So there's, you know, it's a little bit more than certainly other states. And um, if you want to just keep the, the gun in, the, in your home, that's all you have to do. If you want to carry your gun out in public, um, the, the training requirement becomes a little bit more stringent, and the local police chief has to sign off. And so if if you passed a background check, but the police chief knows something about you, he can say no and turn that down. And that's really important. I went to, there's an appeals process. If you get turned down and you want to appeal it, um, they, have a, they have hearings every, every month. And I went to one of them and spent the day there listening to all these people who were appealing it. And I was very thankful that local police chiefs had the ability to um, turn down gun permits because these were people you did not want. Um, carrying guns around. Um, as I mentioned, the, the lost and stolen firearms, I'm going to talk about the gun violence prevention order in a moment. Um, so the, the last law that we passed was in 2016, which there had been this loophole where if you were um, subject of a domestic violence temporary restraining order, well, let me put it this way, if you have a permanent restraining order against you, you're not allowed to own a gun. But if you had a temporary restraining order, you were. And um, so for that like 
10 to 14 day period, you're allowed to own the gun. The problem is that's the most dangerous time because that's when usually the woman has sort of said, enough, I'm leaving. Um, and there was a woman, Lori Jackson, and that's, that's her mother, um, who was killed the day before the hearing to see if the, the order would be made permanent. Um, so it took us two years to pass this law, and I have to say it was an eye-opener for me in terms of we have some very, very extreme legislators in our legislature, and you know they're of the mindset that you know no no gun law is a good law. Um, there's a um, project in um, Bridgeport, Hartford, and New Haven. It's called Project Longevity. It's based on the secure violence model, um, and it really, based on a lot of research that have been done outside of Connecticut, um, they realized in urban settings most of the gun violence either the the victims or the perpetrators was a very small group of people. And so if they could intervene um, and try to do things both in terms of making it very clear what the consequences for violence were, but also giving them support services, when, whether it was mental health support or job training or housing, and they sort of put these carrot and stick approach together and it's been very effective. And it's been very effective all around the country. Um, so that's, that's the good news. Um, as I mentioned, our gun laws are constantly under assault. Um, Doug Dubisky would be one of the cheerleaders of that, and you know he has this extreme view that um, you know that that our intention is just to allow people to carry muskets around. And that's that's our ultimate goal, um, and and he operates that way. Um, on the federal side, obviously, um, a year and a week ago, we had a very different feeling of what was going to happen. It was unprecedented that gun control discussions were actually a part of the, the presidential campaign, and that on the Democratic side between Hillary and Bernie, they were actually trying to see who was the strongest on the measure. I mean, that was just, wow, that's a change. Um, but things didn't go as we wanted, which is why we're all sitting here. Um, and the gun lobby really does feel empowered. They poured $30 million into Trump's campaign, which was more than any other individual contributor. Um, and they want something for that, um, and they're getting stuff for that. Um, and the, the the measure of just how close Trump is to the NRA is this was some kind of policy strategy strategy session, and Wayne LaPierre was sitting right next to him. Trump was the first person since Reagan to address the NRA convention, um, and he made it very clear where he stands on um, protecting access to guns. Um, there, so they actually have passed a number of bills, or, or they've got, made a number of changes, and in particular, there were two, I guess, administrative, administrative changes that the Obama administration had made, I think, towards the end of his, um, his administration, where um, people who were uh, judged to be so mentally ill, Social Security beneficiaries so mentally ill that they couldn't manage their own financial affairs, they were excluded from getting guns. And the same thing for um, people in the veterans, getting services from the Veterans Administration, and they reversed both those rules. Um, and it's, you, we have to be careful that mental illness does not equal violence, but serious mental illness can. Um, and there, is, there was an appeals process, so if you felt it was you know, unright to be excluded, there was a, a process. Um, but so, and it's interesting because after Sutherland Springs, Trump tweeted, this isn't a guns problem, it's a mental health problem, yet he just loosened the restrictions on people with serious mental illness. Um, there's kind of two main bills that are trying to make their way through Congress right now. One is this federally mandated concealed carry reciprocity. Um, right now, states will issue permits for people to carry guns, and some of them have reciprocity with other states who have issued permits under similar or not conditions. In Connecticut, we do not recognize any other state's permits. Um, you, as an out-of-stater, you can get a gun permit if you want. You can apply for one. What this bill would do is require every state to recognize the concealed carry permits of every other state. And there are a lot of states that have very weak permitting systems, um, so weak that there are convicted felons walking around with guns in public. Um, and there, there's some, I, I won't go into the details. So right now, both this and um, the 
bill to deregulate silencers, which they euphemistically call the Hearing Protection Act. Um, so this is, silencers were regulated in the Gun Control Act of 1934. And basically there's registration, so we know who actually owns um, silencers. There's a tax, a $300 tax, which back in 1934 was huge. It hasn't changed since then, but that you know, creates a little bit of a barrier. Um, and there's a stricter um, uh, uh, background check. I think you have to get fingerprints. And it's worked. Silencers are rarely used in crimes. Um, but wanting something to sell and make money off of, the gun lobby um, has very explicitly said, and there was some guy who was quoted, um, you know, they want to make it easier to buy these things. Uh, and, you know, aside from if you think about the, the danger in public, you know, in active shooter situations where you don't know where the gun, you know, law enforcement doesn't know where the gunfire is coming from, that's dangerous. There's also systems um, that have been installed around the country called shot spotters or similar, where they they listen for gunfire and so they can very they essentially triangulate so they can very quickly tell these systems can tell where gunfire came from and so police and emergency medical services can be dis dispatched before anybody actually calls um, and so that helps with both crime prevention as well as um, safety. Um, over the past month, there has been a flurry of sort of reintroduced bills um, based on what, what happened at Las Vegas and Sutherland Springs and I think the, um, the Democrats kind of feel like we have to do something, at least at least symbolically. These, except the very last one, these are not going to pass. Um, but universal background checks has been reintroduced. Um, bump stock ban has been um, introduced, but it's not necessarily going to pass. What the NRA was calling for was more regulation, but the ATF has already said they can't regulate it under the, the current law. So Congress has to do that. So it's really a, a red herring. Um, assault weapons and large capacity magazine ban, um, a number of domestic violence um, victim protection laws. And then lastly, this one based on the Sutherland Springs where that person should have been stopped from buying a gun, but his, um, his domestic violence record was not entered by the, the Army. Um, and so this was just announced like, just in the last two days that Murphy and, and Cornyn have gotten together and propose this bill and you can and so it may actually pass and so it's it's basically same thing that happened after Virginia Tech when they realized that the records weren't being submitted particularly in that case mental health records um, this is trying to shore up the submission of the records that need to get into NIC so that the background check system works uh, and it is interesting if you look at the the, the, the co-sponsors of all these bills you see there's not much red but here it's seven Democrats and, and six Republicans that actually could pass, uh, which, which would be a good thing. Um, here in Connecticut, uh, fundamentally, there, there are Republicans who support strong gun laws in Connecticut. Um, and, and the bills that have passed have been bipartisan, although quite unbalanced. Um, but it's getting very hard now because the Democrats used to have like a 70 vote um, vote margin, um, and now it's down to seven votes, which means they really have like a three vote margin. That's if everybody shows up. Um, so it is very, very difficult. Um, and this 2018 election is going to be critical for what happens. Um, if the legislature flips, we certainly won't get any new gun laws. Whether they actually try to undo some stuff is, is kind of open to um, um, our guesses. Every year, these guys and a couple of others introduce a whole lot of bad bills. Every year they try to actually repeal the, the post-Sandy Hook bill, which was universal background checks and assault weapons ban. Um, and I gotta keep moving. Um, so I talked about um, Southbury. There's a whole bunch of um, gun lobby myths, and I'm not gonna go through them too much, but the first one is that gun laws don't work, which is just an absurd statement because the statement is criminals don't follow laws, which is like, we get that. Um, but they, they actually do work. Um, one measure is since the Brady background checks went into, into effect, two and a half million purchases have been stopped. And those were by people that for one reason or another were prohibited from buying guns. 
Um, another favorite one is the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy. Um, total fallacy. Lots of statistics. One of them is um, only um, in, in active shooter incidents, only 3% of them are stopped by armed citizens. Most of them are stopped by other means. Um, and guns make us safer is another thing. And the problem, this is one of the critical issues in terms of really advancing legislation at the national level is people believe that guns make them safer and they believe it a whole lot more now than they did 15 years ago. And until we change that perception, people aren't going to be in favor of stricter gun laws. Um, but the fact is, particularly in the House, they do not make you safer and there's um, studies that are coming out that show uh, that states that have weak um, permitting, concealed carry permitting laws have higher levels of violence. Um, this is worth a discussion on its own. Let me just very quickly say that, um, like the rest of the country, two-thirds of our gun deaths are from suicide, so we have to do something about that, and laws really aren't the answer. Um, and uh, limiting access to firearms absolutely will lower suicides. Um, and we are lucky in Connecticut, we have this um, it's the technical, technically called risk warrant law, um, we're trying to use a more kind of user-friendly term, which is the gun violence protection order. And that allows um, anybody can go to law enforcement and say, I think this person is a danger to themselves or others. Um, they will do an investigation, and if they agree, the guns can be removed. And there was a study done out of um, Yale and Duke and UConn that found, that found for every 10 to 20 guns removed, there was one suicide averted. So um, at CAGB, we're going to be working on a program to increase awareness of that. Um, Last, so what can people do? Um, and there's a, there's a lot of things you can do, and some of them like really easy, and obviously some of them take more um, more effort. And whatever level you want to do is fabulous. So um, the reason we ask you to sign up is so that we can keep in touch. And a lot of times you do, you know, have particularly at the state level, um, ask you to contact legislators. Um, you know, try to find other friends to join the cause. Get kids involved. This um, picture I showed you. Um, that was my thought. So we went to the March for Change rally in Hartford. It was in Valentine's Day 2013, and she walked away with a new experience. Um, most important is contacting legislators, and that's both to thank them for what they're doing, as well as, you know, when it's appropriate, as well as to tell them that you want them to vote for a particular bill or vote against the bill. And I want to emphasize thanking legislators who do the right thing is really important. Every time we talk to staff members of her congressional delegation, they say the same thing. You guys got to keep writing and calling and, and um, you know, contacting them because it's, they're hearing from the other side. So if a reporter comes to them and says, like, what are you hearing on this bill? And they say, well, you know, it's, they want to be able to say we're hearing you know, five to one that people are opposed to it. Um, that said, we are very fortunate, obviously, that our congressional delegation is very strong. And so if you know people basically in red states, like, you know, if we send out an alert, send it on to them, get them to contact their legislators. It's kind of the, the same thing that's going along with all this other bad stuff. We've got to get people in red states to um, speak up. Um, I do this kind of thing for much smaller groups. So if you want to get like a collection of 10 friends together, and whether it's in your home or some other community organization, um, we're happy to come talk. Uh, if you see the need for it, call the police for a gun violence protection order. Um, if you're sending your kids over to somebody else's house, ask if there's a gun in the house and if it's safely stored. Um, I've done this and it's, it's, it feels like it's awkward. Nobody's ever had a problem with it. I um, mean, if they do, you don't want to send your kid there. Um, Wear Orange, International Gun Violence um, Awareness Day is June 2nd. And that's an opportunity and to the people, to the extent people sign up or get involved. Um, for doing a lot of stuff at the local level in terms of raising awareness and actually other things. Um, and lastly, and obviously we would like it to be CAGB, but whatever organization, we do need money. The gun lobby raises millions and millions of dollars and we have to have the resources to be able to fight that. So, thank you so much. Um, in the handout, um, some of the, these things are on this list and on the back side or it's the contact information for our congressional delegation and then um, 
this talks about uh, contacting them about concealed carry reciprocity and trying to get to the information. So um, definitely give them a call, send them an email, whatever. Thank you very much, and um, happy to continue the conversation afterwards. Up in the chapel. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jonathan Perlow. Uh, Connecticut against gun violence, and uh, there's been so much here to think about. And over Thanksgiving, <laughs> talk to the fam. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, what rooms are we going to? Yeah. Um, just remember to go over.